Good night, good evening, good morning, wherever you are watching from. Welcome to another episode of Wife Her Live. I'm your host, Zemi Stewart, the founder of Wife Her Ministry. Wife Her stands for Wife Healed, Empowered, Restored, and we are all about just that, creating opportunities for women to become her, healed, empowered, and restored. And tonight we have a special guest. We have Inger Miller, all the way in somewhere in Canada. You got to tell me where. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Metro Vancouver. Um, oh, Vancouver. Okay. Originally from Nassau. And she um, has an excellent story for us tonight. And we're talking all about becoming a mother who is called blessed. And Inger is specially positioned for this conversation because of her motherhood journey, you know, raising two beautiful teens, teens now. Um, suffering a miscarriage, having an angel baby, and now having a daughter who requires a lot of mom, a lot of dad, and a lot of love. And so without further ado, Inga, can you walk us through your parenting journey um, from first baby on, from when you found out that you got that positive pregnancy test onward? Yeah, so um, I got pregnant with Isaiah very early. Um, I was raised very Catholic, um, very religious. Um, I was the typical, you know, um, youth group leader and everything else. Um, um, I had a high school sweetheart, really typical relationship. Um, and, um, you know, as we say in the Palmas, like moving too fast mm -hmm. and found out that I was pregnant at 19. Um, you know, um, I could recall his dad was like, what does, what do two lines mean? You know, like we were that, that young, right? He was 19 too? Um, he think he was 20, like at the yeah. time. Yeah. But that young, right? Like summer job young, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, that was probably my easiest pregnancy. And it was because I was that naive. Um, I had no idea of what could possibly go wrong. And therefore I had no stress about yeah. what could possibly go wrong. You know, um, I had Isaiah early, um, so he was blessed from the beginning because he was born so early. They'd given me um, like special injections to develop his lungs and things like that, and he came out super premature, super thin, but healthy and didn't require any help. Um, so we left the next morning. Um, after I got pregnant with Haley, um, that pregnancy was not so easy. Um, lots of random heavy bleeding each time I went to the doctor Dr. Simmons at that time he was incredible um each time basically he was like well you know prepare yourself he would say a prayer which I loved and he would say you know prepare yourself we may we we, we may not see anything right and each time I thought that I may have lost her and she persisted <laughs> she's still that personality um I once again was on bed rest for quite a while with her because of the bleeding and medication um, to kind of um, stop contractions. But at that time I wasn't diagnosed with anything, right? Um, it was just kind of like, well, we don't know why this happens, right? And so that was fine. So again, she was healthy. Um, so at that point, I didn't think that I had any reproductive issues or any concerns to, to, to kind of speak of, right? Um, after um, I had divorced and remarried, um, my husband and I, um, we um, had talked about children and had planned on having children. And um, we unexpectedly got pregnant with Bella and we were really excited. I remember um, I, was kind of, I was trying not to tell him, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I was just so sick. I remember at one point I was in the mall, I was just like, I'm just a little hot. <laughs> I was just so sick. I was trying to keep the secret for the right time. Um, I was trying to wait for our anniversary, which was um, October 18th in order to tell him, but I, I, I didn't make it. <laughs> Um, and he was so excited. Um, we were really, really thrilled. Um, once again, I took it for granted, right? Because in my mind, I'd had two children already. Like, you know, this was my first rodeo. I was fine. Yeah. Um, in, on January 18th of 2017, I recall having a really bad stomach ache. Um, I was like, oh, well, you know, typical. But I was headed off to, um, I, I was in my master's program um, strange country, everything else, bad weather. Um, and I was headed to do a presentation that day. And I, um, I went to the bathroom, um, and I just started to deliver Bella. Um, had no idea what was going on, complete chaos in the house and everything else. 
Um, we went to the hospital and they told us that our best case scenario was to just abort her instantly. Um, we asked, um, we, of course, I, I'm, so my background is research. Um, I'm a environmental economist, right, by trade. And I um, started to do research and realize people, you know, did things like bed rest, drink uh, like, like, like all kinds of fluids, like people had protein shakes as options, all kinds of things online. Basically what had happened was um, my, my actual water bag first, and she was about 22 weeks, but there was a little smidgen of chance um, to kind of like hold on to her if we had, you know, come up with some way that I could just continuously, you know, keep her in there, right? And apparently, you know, the body does like produce additional amniotic fluid, right? So we said, no, we said we would not sign on to just abort, like elect to abort our child, right? And this is a baby I could feel moving, right? Like, how do you make that choice, right? So we prayed and prayed, went home, we asked for like medication or anything, they refused. Um, they told us that um, that in Canada, they have, uh, um, they have guidelines that they don't resuscitate nor help once a child is below 24 weeks. We asked what that meant. They said, should she be born? They will not assist in trying to help her at all, which was horrendous to me. I figured, you know, if any child would, you know, was to be born, there should be some type of help. So we went home on this mission that we were gonna try everything that we would find online. Um, and um, that night I just started to feel really, really unwell. Um, just insanely unwell. Um, the next day, um, so that night I started to develop a fever. We were like, okay, well, let's just take, you know, Panadol, I feel that kind of stuff. Um, I later found out that like, I, I actually could have passed away that night. Um, they said that by the time as I arrived to the hospital, like early the next day, I had um, septicemia. Um, my, like all of the color from my fingernails were gone. Like I was literally starting to die. Um, I can recall so well, like just before we got in there, like I was completely out of my mind, like hallucinating actually, but I could feel her like that, those last few kicks, I have just kept with me for the rest of my life, right? Um, I don't remember much of what happened, but I told me that they came to him and said, like, you need to make a decision. Like things are going really bad. Like we have to move urgently to save her. And, um, they wanted to just take her out and um, by God's grace, I was I managed to deliver her. She was so tiny, it didn't take much effort. Um, she was still warm. We held in everything else, but she 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 obviously passed in utero, right? Um, here, I was blessed that they have what's called a cooling cot. It's probably a little odd for some people, but they provide you a cooling cot that's in the room that basically mimics what a typical baby's cot would look like. Um, and you can keep the child with you. Um, that went on for days. I don't think that that was the intent, but it's the closest that I've ever been to insanity. Honestly, um, I just slipped like all the way down that rabbit hole of depression and everything else. Um, and it's because when you first get pregnant, all the joys that you have, but as you go along, somebody who's separate, like, yes, dad, and everyone is, is like excited, but as you feel this child growing in you, when you feel this child move and everything else, you start to have hopes, dreams, thoughts, like you start to develop personality, right? Yeah, Based on when, yeah. they, when you feel them move and, mm -hmm. you know, things you eat and you wonder like, oh, do you like that? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, all these things that you get very like connected with. Um, and that was very, very hard to leave. Um, and, um, you know, I I honestly, I like, I, I'm not even sure like how Brad made it during that point, right? Because this is his um, first child. You his know, first child. Is which is a whole different level of excitement and hopes and dreams. Yeah. Yeah. And from our first conversations, he talked about, I could remember he talked about how he wanted like children. And I teased him because he had these ideals of what children, of what his kids would be like. And I was like, Isaiah and Hilly are like total opposites. <laughs> oh, you think that's what you're going to get? And I would tease him, I'm like, God has jokes. Mm -hmm. Like you never get what you anticipate. Right. Like, I thought I would get a girly girl with Haley and she came out like all Rambo. Right? <laughs> it's just funny, you know? So it was really, really hard on Brad. Yeah. Really hard on the relationship as well. Um, I think because I really wanted him to be emotional with me in that emotional state. And for him, it was very much, well, 
he needs to remain stable. He needs to be that older, right? Like he has to do all the functioning things for the family, like dinner. We still had two, two kids, right? Yeah. Dinner and everything else that was needed. Um, and he couldn't just wash away in tears along with me. And that made me feel very separate and apart, you know? It made me feel very lonely in my grief. Um, at that time too, I went through like months of being very angry towards God, very much. I'll be honest, I quite frankly said, well, you know, people have babies who throw them away. Yeah. Like people have, you know, abortions all of the time. And this was a child that we wanted so bad, you know, um, had talked about so many nights, you know, um, and had prepared for and had space for um, and wanted to love on, right? Um, so that was very difficult. Um, shortly after we decided that we would try again, and didn't take long. We said, oh, let's go to Vegas. <laughs> so we can see the I Vegas. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Go to like Arkansas or something. But <laughs> um, go to it. Um, Brooke, um, Brooke was quite a, in an interesting little bundle. Um, this time around, they diagnosed me with cervical incompetency. Um, they said, you know, that, um, that my cervix was an issue, um, although there's no real test per se for it. And so, so I had throughout all of your pregnancies? I guess so, yeah, I guess so. They, 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 so, so what they'd mentioned is some women just have it in terms of the cervix just doesn't close like it should and doesn't stay, it doesn't stay closed. Um, and so that's why women have kids earlier, but it seems though as I got older, it became more of an issue. Oh, okay. Yes, and weaker, right? Because those things weaken as, as you age. Um, I was maybe about, I don't know, 32 or something at, like around that time, which is young, but you know, still. Um, I just learned that anything after 35 is called geriatric pregnancy. So, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so I know, right? They just you know? all these crazy terms. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we, yeah, we had lots of tests with Brooke. Um, everything oh. showed that she was fine. Um, I did mention, you know, especially later on that. You know, once again, it wasn't my first rodeo. And as my stomach got bigger, I didn't feel like Brooke occupied that space. They said, no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. I said, no, she's not. Like, she's not kicking my ribs. She's not coming higher, higher up. Like, what's going on is she's small. I said, no, she was fine. Um, they took the, the actual circlage out. So basically what it does is it kind of like does like a purse string almost like around the cervix to keep it closed. And they removed it. Within a week, um, I went into labor with Brooke. Um, I had all the children naturally, no drugs, so I can threaten them whenever I want to. Um, and um, Brooke was born and she did not cry. She did not breathe on her own. She did not do anything. And this was the only child I've ever had full term. <laughs> so um, they whisked her away, like in the corner um, and um, kind of tried to distract me as much as possible. And I, I thank God that it almost seemed as though there was a veil between us. Like it, I wasn't even, because I wasn't drugged or anything, but like some reason I just didn't see any of that. Um, and I feel as though that that was a kindness. I feel as though that was grace because I probably would have lost my mind. And um, she went to NICU and everything else. Um, you know, after that, it started a huge battle with things that I noticed that she just didn't do. She just did, she's just yeah. lacked like all the typical reflexes. It was like having a super preemie who had no idea how to do these typical things. She had issues breathing. She didn't know how to latch. She didn't show any appetite. Like she didn't open her eyes, like all of these things. And they just kept on telling me like, it's fine, it's fine. And then it, it, and then came all the whispers like, you know, maybe she has postpartum. Like she's making this stuff up. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, um, I wasn't. Um, at about six months, I think, people started to listen to me in terms of like doctors that she didn't like hold her head up well, she didn't roll over, like all of these different things. Um, and fast forward with that to last year, May, we got, we finally got the diagnosis after so much advocating for her and so many emails and paperwork and just everything else. But she has super rare genetic disorder. It's called coffin Cyrus syndrome. Didn't inherit it from us. They call it a lightning strike chance. Um, so it can happen to anyone. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Yep. Yeah. Anyone at all. Um, um, it's um, de novo, um, which means the same. Um, it's not um, um, inherited. But basically what it is, 
is she has a duplication of one of her genes. And so basically you could imagine a sentence and if the sentence says the cat ran across the road for you and I that don't have any of these issues, hers may say the cat ran, ran across the road. And so her body is kind of confused about some things in terms of what to do, right? And basically it impacts every single cell. So everything you and I take for granted in terms of how you know how to lift up, you know, your hand to remove a hat. And like basically she has to learn all of these things. So we were hit with that. They told us about, it was about 200 people worldwide that have it. Um, we've since, you know, met with so many others and that's been great. Um, they also, we also got the diagnosis at the same time that she was severely autistic. Um, so that was, you know, quite a bit of challenge in terms of they explained that it comes along with cognitive um, disability and things like that. Um, and then they started to tell us all the things that she would never do. You know, um, she may never walk. She probably won't ever talk. She won't ever do this. You know, she, she won't ever climb the stairs. She won't, you know, all of these other things. Um, she was also diagnosed with what they call cerebellum dysplasia, which basically means that her cerebellum is malformed and your cerebellum deals with gross and fine motor skills as well as coordination. So how you pick up things, um, how you know to cut a scissors, like all of those things that you take for granted. But, you know, um, I have spent numerous nights of sleepless nights um, researching every single thing. Like I'm talking like going through like medical journals and like, you know, when you're going through a medical journal and you're like copy and pasting inside like a dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically you're like, Trying to trying to figure out like almost like, in like a different language with so these you things. Didn't even, you didn't even get a moment to like sit back and say like, "Wow, what does this mean for my life, the rest of my life?" You just like straight into, "Let me find a way to help my child." Yeah. Yep. It was no, you know, because we'd also found out that what they call the golden years. The golden years are what happened before five, mm -hmm. and so before five is when that child is making all of those connections. And before five is that super important time to make sure that they're getting all of the necessary therapies, right? Um, and all of these things, although we're in Canada where like medical care, like they say it's free, but you pay for it, right? <laughs> Through taxes and everything else, mm -hmm. which I pay a lot of. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, there's wait lists for everything and there's a process for everything. Yeah. And so there's no time to wait, right? Um, thankfully at that time, she was she was already involved with quite a bit of different therapies that I kind of advocated for. So physio, OT, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, um, speech and all the rest. Um, but once again, you know, huge wait times for all of these, right? Um, and money even associated, right? Because um, for her to get the autism assessment, we still would have been waiting had we not gone private. Um, and to go private, I think it was about 3,000 some for the, just for the test. Yeah. So, you know, with everything, there are a lot of hoops to kind of jump through, right? Um, but lots of investigations, Emmy. Like every day, I spend so many hours researching like every single thing I could think of, like today and even during the day, like, you know, um, so much admin pieces in terms of like emails back and forth. And, even just questions, right? Because you invite specialists into your lives, but then it also changes how things work because you have to be accountable, right? So like she has a whole feeding team. And when I say it's team, I mean several people just on feeding. She has more than one feeding team. So I'm talking about dozens and dozens of specialists that we interact with all of the time, right? That want updates in terms of like, what is she eating today? How much? How much milliliters? At what time? Like super specific, Yeah. you know? So I started to like ask questions and I realized the majority of moms, the vast majority, I want to say maybe like 87% of moms, they don't work. And it's who, because they can't. Who have a daughter or a child that has this disease. Yeah. I mean, even autism on its own, there I know mothers who that is their child is just everything because of the demands. And then you have it compounded where you have one, two, three. So yeah, definitely. Yep. No. Um, and that was something to think about in terms of, you know, what do we do from here, right? Um, 
that, you know, we moved to Canada for so many other reasons, right? Um, you know, and, you know, like I said, I had a teenage child who's about to go to college. So he needs money to go to college. How do I stop working? <laughs> you know, and everything kind of stopped for Brooke, right? Like there's a lot of emphasis on Brooke, but there's also two other children who have needs as well, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, I've continued working. Um, my job is very technical. Um, it's very male dominated. And so there's not much space for that female fragility. Yeah, <laughs> or like I what mean, happens. Saying, my life. children need me today. Nope, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. No, well, you know, it's actually frowned upon, right? Yeah. Um, and it's something that I thought about and I've thought to myself, well, should I, should I maybe look for something else to do or kind of in the space of sustainability, but move, right? And then I thought, well, why, mm -hmm. right? Like, why, why should I, right? Um, so I've tried my best to balance. Um, can't say my self care is great or existent <laughs> much, um, but um, I do the best I can, you know. Um, and I juggle and I give everything to, you know, um, to what their needs are and specifically Brooke's needs, you know. Um, I worry so how, quite a bit. How do you manage like your your teens wanting some of you, some of mom? when all of this is happening? Sure. So part of it, well, I guess a blessing is because they are teenagers, they don't want a whole lot of me. <laughs> That's true. So, a lot of it is, like, they can never a lot, right? So I would go in, like, I, I but I'm very intentional about it. Yeah. So I make sure that I go in their rooms and I check in and be like, how was your day? What cool happened today? And, like, make time that... You know, um, this is just when I take Haley out. Like before COVID, we would do like mall days and things like that. You know, um, I think like um, Saturday, she wanted to go ahead and do lashes. Yeah, she's that old now. So like now we're going to do like lashes. And then we kind of went around to like flat nurseries together and things like that. You know, um, Isaiah wants like less like one-on-one -on -one time. Um, he and Brad do a lot of that. Like they go and play, and play basketball and do stuff like yeah. that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I try to make sure that all of their needs are met. And I try to be intentional where, let's say if one of them comes up and says, oh, I want to tell you something, I stop and turn my chair. Like, mm -hmm. stop. Yeah. Because the truth is that they don't get a whole lot of time, right? So just, so I so I really try to concentrate to make put that, like, that little bit of time, quality time. Mm -hmm. You know, like family movie nights, we'll curl and watch stuff. We tend to eat dinners together. I think that's really important is um, I cook a lot, as you can tell. <laughs> no, I cannot tell, you are great. <laughs> so, we eat dinners a lot together. Um, so we're all foodies, um, you know, or, you know, just, just time kind of like being, you know, um, I would intentionally yeah, go like, Isaiah. Really like social really media, you can tell like when you guys are doing family time, it's family time. Mm -hmm. You know, we are out here, we're doing this and we're together as a family. There's no distractions, there's no phones, unless we're taking a photo. And you know that is that's what people remember. Like I grew up with a family dinner family, and mm -hmm. that is that is amazing. And and it's crazy because a lot of people don't do it, but it was so awesome to sit around the table, to have conversations or not have conversations, to have someone say eat more veggies, like all any all of that. You know, it's things that you miss and it's things that you cherish when it's taken away. And it's so important to do those things. So definitely value that and everything that you're doing. Um, definitely want you to get the self care. I'm trying. <laughs> but I know that you know what you need and eventually how to prioritize. Um, and yeah. I know you're still in the works of trying to get everything sorted out for Brooke. You know, trying to continue to understand, continue to find resources for her. Um, but is, is she in any programs because her illness is so rare? Like any studies where they cover her care? Um, so, 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 so she's a part of the Coffin Cyrus study. And so we've signed her up so that they could use, you know, her um, data um, and, you know, in the event that, so what they do as well is in the event that she ever has like surgeries where they could possibly remove a few cells to do those different studies, then we've already elected for them to go ahead and do so, right? Um, so she's enrolled in all of those things, but because she's autistic, um, here um, they have um, an option where she gets funds per year that goes towards therapy. So that, that is really helpful. And for that we pay, um, so she gets therapy um, two days a week um, for six days a week. So 
I'm um, sorry, two hours, two hours a day, six days a week. And we have um, um, therapists that come into the house and do therapy, but that's more so just on the autism side and separate and apart from that, she does physio and different things like that. Um, we, um, like I said, Canada has some free resources as well as we pay for um, for for extended help. So we yeah. can do some of those private. So we do the free, the private, as well as the funded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we kind of cover yeah, all three to, bases. You know, it's, 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 a, it's crazy, but you, you try so hard to find ways to, you know, just, just to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, but you can give a progress report of what she's been doing because yeah. of all of the things that you guys have her involved in and your advocacy early on, you know, to catch this thing and to let get people to listen to you. And I wish people would listen more to moms like moms know, you know, you knew from the womb that something was, was off and you turned out to be correct. And so mm -hmm. I just hope that we take that away to to even follow your example and advocate for ourselves and to speak up and advocate for our children. Because we know, even if you've been on the rodeo before, even if it's your first child, sometimes you you really know what feels right and what doesn't feel right. But let's move into what Brook, Brookie Cookie <laughs> is doing um, because yeah. I do follow her journey and I am so inspired by you know the whole the whole thing. Yeah, so um, Brookie Cookie is walking. Um, she's actually trying to run now. <laughs> yeah, you know um, How it's so funny. You? Oh yeah, she's she's um she's um, she's um, trying to run. Um, I I kind of tease and say that she walks like um Sanford from Sanford and Son. <laughs> um, and I think that's part of it too, right? Like I think early on, you know, we kind of decided, well, what do we do about her like quote unquote illness, right? Is like as Bahamians, we tease and that's how we show love. And so we didn't want it to be kind of like this boogeyman in the corner that nobody talks about. Mm -hmm. And so we all openly talk about it. And even in terms of how she walks, and right now she's walking fine, but we're, we just we just laugh about it and we're like, oh, that's our little Sanford, right? <laughs> and we just think it's so cute. So like everything about it, we just accept Brooke where she is and that's yeah. perfectly okay, you know? Um, perfectly okay, you know? And she's um, trying to feed herself now. She's trying to feed herself. So yeah. she is so she so she has a G tube that um because she has so many oral aversions and like challenges in terms of swallowing even, right? Because once again, you kind of underestimate how much coordination you need to chew food around, move it around your mouth, swallow and everything else. So that's a challenge for her. Um, but um she also has the autism piece, which makes her very sensitive towards scent and what something looks like and something kind of like coming close to her face and like so a lot of those things um, take quite a bit of therapy. And, you know, it's not just the time in therapy per se, but it's all the tools they give us that we have to work on every evening. Yeah. Right. So, um, but she's doing all of that. Um, she's also, you know, um, you know, like I said, it's always been, you know, um, so Coffin Cyrus also comes with um, um, cognitive disability. Um, and so a lot of the persons, you know, if they are in their 20s or older, they may be, you know, cognitively maybe about six years old, right? But Brooke has already shown that she's super tricky and you have to be smart enough to be tricky. And she could <laughs> outgo for us. <laughs> she, you know, she's 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 been like finding wherever her dad like tries to hide her iPad and like looking and smiling about it. She has a little villain laugh. Like she sounds like she's in like a cartoon, <laughs> you know? Um, so lots of like trickiness. Um, Saturday, we realized that she was able to open up her own door and escape to come to the loft to play with her own toys. Um, and the door is closed. We're like, how the heck did she do that? Um, so well, she's going to make a way. She's going to make a way. Yeah. And you shouldn't, yep. you shouldn't underestimate what she can do. And she's been born here, but she's all Bahamian. She's so sassy <laughs> and spicy. Like, and she actually, nope. So it's so funny how things work because she walks around with her hands in a kimba oh, and she's not seen us do that. And I'm like, this girl is like straight out of Andres because Brad, Brad, both of his parents are from Andres. I'm like, she's straight out of Andres. <laughs> but it's like, how does she know that? You know? Um, but she just has all of this personality. And even though she's not speaking, it's so much like non-verbal cues, you know? When she wants like something to eat now, she goes to her high chair and she shakes it. <laughs> and she's looking at me and she slams it. And I'm like, she just needs like a bamboo shot counter now to slam on. <laughs> she ready, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, you always, as, 
as the mom, and I, I say this because, like, obviously I'm a fur mom at this point, and so my fur babies can't speak to me. So when they're meowing or when they're doing something, I have to, like, really focus in on all of these little cues that they're giving me to try to understand what they need. And it's just a part of mothering us as moms, you know? Whatever, what, whoever we mother, wherever we, we mother, picking up on those cues, sorry for the noise, picking up on those cues to make sure that we meet the needs. And um, that is a special skill that we all should be able to celebrate. And those viewing, those watching, you know, if you, you have that skill as well, and we should celebrate ourselves all month long, all year long, because of so much of our innate abilities that make us great moms. And you are an amazing mom, Inga, amazing mom. And this platform, we've talked a lot about your kids, but this discussion tonight is about, you know, being a mom who is called blessed. You know, you being an advocate, you rising up to the plate as a young mom, um, you know, you taking care of yourself throughout these times, you managing your mental health and trying so so quickly after a miscarriage or after a, what's it, what is it called? When- Stillbirth. Mm -hmm. Stillbirth, yeah. After, you know, all of those different things combined to make you on this segment tonight, a mother who is called blessed. So let's focus on, on you and the skill set and where you pull your strength from for each of these circumstances. Yeah, um, I think, you know, it goes back to, I guess, the anger I had after I, after I lost Bella um, and kind of reframing that and trying to understand what is there to learn from this yeah. what is the path um that god has that obviously i don't understand i still don't understand all of it not even there right um have you been I think angry me, lately like about the situation um i would say shortly after we got the diagnosis shortly after we got the diagnosis i was really angry um you know um I just thought to myself, well, you know, um, I'd lost a daughter and here we were, we prayed heavily to get pregnant. We prayed heavily for a healthy, you know, pregnancy. We did everything, right? Don't eat the shellfish, no sushi for you. Like I did everything, right? That's supposed to be right, right? Um, and I was just like, what did I miss? <laughs> like, what did I miss? <laughs> you know, um, and so I, I kind of felt like I was set up, you know? Um, and so a lot of that was understanding that things are beyond me and that I am, you know, it's not all about Inga. You know, the world tells us like, oh, what was you? <laughs> like, it's all about you. Yeah. But the, the point is, is that I am one participant in this relay race of this design that God has. I can't understand all of it because I am one small little piece, right? And my little piece may be just helping somebody else who has a child with coffin cyrus, you know, um, helping someone else of how to deal with medical supplies, which I've had like a crazy learning curve of having to learn all of these medical things, you know, in order to do at home, right? Um, especially during COVID because you can't take a compromise kid to the ER for everything, yeah. right? So you have to do things at home. Um, so a lot of it is, is really helping with patients and it's really, really dialed back all of that, like, anxious energy I used to have about like doing things quickly and having to fix quickly and you know having to figure out quickly and really to pull back and just stop really just stop and just sit in it and that to be okay to sit in it because that takes so much faith to understand that as you sit you may not be doing anything but God is doing something Wow. And I didn't have that before. It, I just felt like I had to figure it out instantly. <laughs> you know, like I have to do all these things, right? And the thing is, is that I can't. So really, really what helped me was I had to reach the end of myself. Like the absolute nothing else left. <laughs> what did that look like, like? It was messy. <laughs> <laughs> it was messy and ugly. It was like ugly cry, messy, you know? Um, um, and I think it's because I've always been like a very type A personality. Like, you know, I can do everything, you know? <laughs> um, try everything, you know, I can make anything work except this. Like, you know, I think when I realized like, oh, you mean I can't figure out my way? There's no amount of research that I can do to fix it. You know, there's, there's no one I could find in this world to just make it right, you know? Um, and that's when I, I realized like, okay, well, beyond this is only God, eh? And the more beyond this is only God, the more space he occupied. 
Wow. You know, and he just got like further and further, further into Inga. <laughs> so maybe if we started, if we started like a 90 10, he's like somewhere like, I don't know, <laughs> much more than that, but like a 70 30. I still try to fight. <laughs> you know, I'm like, no, I, I got this, you know. Um, but I've been really, really trying to like dial back and just say, you know, um, we will see, you know. Um, and even with that, you know, there are no guarantees about Brooke's health. Right. Um, you know, every year she has to be screened for, you know, heart conditions and um, her spinal cord and, you know, um, eyesight and hearing because all of that comes along with cough and cyrus that they lose. They can lose any of those. Right. And even that when worry started to consume me about, oh, my gosh, well, what if this happens? And she and she loses this. But then one of my healthy children at any point, anything can happen to anyone. Yeah. You know, um, so it just comes back to faith. Um, and daily, one of my prayers are, you know, sometimes it's like, God, anything that's happened to my children, I'm going to go crazy. Please don't let anything happen to them. <laughs> but it's also, God, please help me. Like, pre please, please strengthen me because I cannot handle it. You know, like, and even that, the understanding that sometimes my prayer usually is as well, like, God, do you have me confused? Because you're putting really too much on my shoulders. <laughs> like, I think you have me confused with, like, somebody who's, like, super he he hero, right? Like, you know, and I feel, like, just, like, this is just me, though. <laughs> you know? Um, but I try to pay it forward and help you know, other women as much as I can. Um, and, you know, I've seen my teenagers blossom and grow in so many ways. Brooke has taught them so much. They are going to be better individuals for it. I mean, in ways that I can't even explain. Um, and for that, I'm so grateful. And they teach me things, right? Um, maybe about a year ago, um, Haley has some friends over. And as Brooke has gotten older, it's become more obvious that something is awry, right? And she had friends over. And I think one of her friends was like expecting Brooke to get up and walk to her. And Brooke just was like no response and didn't move and just was like kind of like on her tummy. And I asked Haley, I said, well, how do you handle things like that? And I said, what do you say if like your friends are like, well, how come your sister isn't walking? And she said, she's like, I just tell them she isn't walking. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, why don't I do that? Why do I feel as a mom, I have to overly explain like all these medical things rather than just saying, oh, she isn't talking. <laughs> and just leave and, it there. And even, even you know, having to explain genetic, not genetic, you know, because people automatically want to say, well, is it related to something that you guys did? Shouldn't you have gotten tested? And I want you to release that too, that you don't have to do that because that doesn't matter anymore. It's like I lost um, someone close to me last week and someone before they even said my condolences, they said, how did he die? What does it matter? <laughs> the outcome is the outcome and so you release that as well it doesn't matter if it was genetic or not it doesn't make you any less of an amazing mom it doesn't make brad any less of an amazing dad yeah you know and and that's been hard you know um that was really really hard right um you know um so much of it honestly is hard and yeah. even that goes back to sometimes i wonder if Part of all of this is because God was like, you know what? I want you a whole lot closer, <laughs> you know? So, you know, obviously you're obsessed with these kiddos. Let me make sure that you are right here pressed up against my chest, <laughs> you know? Um, and he gave me Burke and he allowed Bella to go back to him, you know, um, because he wanted me that close, you know? Um, and I try to think about that, you know, um, and try to like flip things around in, into a positive way. So I spend way too much money in my garden every year. We only have so many months of good weather, but I do it because um, um, so so um, dragonflies are the symbol of like stillbirth, and sorry, not them dragonflies, um, 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 hummingbirds, hummingbirds, dragonflies okay. on my and it's late, too, too many Zoom meetings, <laughs> but hummingbirds are the symbol of um, of um, of of of, um, of um, stillbirth. And so what I've done is I create a whole garden dedicated towards hummingbirds. Um, so hundreds of dollars <laughs> of like, you know, um, different plants and things like that and different ornaments. Basically I make it a garden that a little girl would love. Um, I have all kinds of little pink, you know, wheels in there. And um, I have a little girl blowing, but um, um, like I'm catching butterflies and 
um, all kinds of things, right? That in my mind, I, you know, I just feel as though well, maybe if she's in heaven, she looks down, she's like, oh, you know, mommy, 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 mommy's still thinking about me, you know, that, that there's some type of memorial for her. And that grants me a lot of peace, you know, as I'm, as I'm, you know, hi, Brad, <laughs> but as I'm like planting and creating and all those things, I think to myself, because I've had so much guilt about that, but I think to myself, there was this child that I love so much that I never got to fuss over and plan a birthday for and everything else. And all of my, everyone who knows me knows I go way too far, <laughs> like I go way beyond everything. I bought every single type of toy that I could think of for Brooke and every type of equipment that I could think of for Brooke. But it's because, you know, I just don't know what else to do, right? But with Bella, I don't get to do those things. So my idea is that I'll do the garden and, and then maybe she can see it. And I think you're doing a great job at that as well because you're giving her a presence in the family. Uh, I didn't know my big brother, Donovan. He died, I think, and he died in 87, and I was born in 1990. So no crossover at all. But my parents always made him seem alive to us. they take us to the graveyard. they tell us, leave him toys. And so I grew up knowing I had a big brother. And it sounds like that's similar to what you're doing with this, you know, the garden. And, and you know, even you bring her up every year so that they know you had a sister, you know. And I think that's very important. It doesn't matter how long or how much you got to experience like me i got to experience nothing and you as well you know a few hours or a few um was it hours a few hours yeah yeah i mean just of like holding our like yeah yeah exactly and so you know but they're still alive to you they're still alive to you she was still here she still left a legacy you gave her a name which is amazing yeah. and you know that garden i'd love to see that garden actually yeah, it's great to get flowers. <laughs> um, I love it. You know, yeah. um, it gives me purpose, and I feel as though it's so healing. Like yeah. honestly, yeah. you know, and I told Brad, like I go in there, and I put on like my music, my you know, my praise and worship, and you know, um, I'm just in there, kind of like going at it. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know. Thank you, Brad. As Brad brings me a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, um, I feel as though God sees that as well. Yeah, and I yeah. feel as though, you know, it's very important for me to, to, to just to express to him that I'm so grateful of these blessings of these children that he's provided to me and that I'm doing everything that I possibly can to raise them in the right way, you know, and to make them wholesome individuals who help other people, you know. Um, and, you know, I just try my best. I don't get it right. They don't come with manuals, unfortunately. Um, but um, I just try my best and I hope for the best. And, you know, even after Brooke, um, I don't know if you remember that movie that came out probably when we were small, it's called, I think, Indian in the Cupboard. But basically it was this little Indian that came alive, you know, <laughs> this little boy. <laughs> and um, so I grew up with, um, so I was um, child number five and everybody was like much older than I was. So I was usually alone. And I always wished like I would have like this, Barbie doll that would come alive and like be my little friend in the house. And so every year I grew up Catholic and we would like write prayers and like you would like go up front and like let them burn. And secretly I always wrote a prayer for my Barbie doll to come alive. <laughs> and with Breck, I think to myself, I was like, well, you know, prayers have a strange way of coming too, right? And I wonder if 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 God was like, oh, you wanted a little forever friend. So I've given you a little forever friend. Because we're gonna be movie buddies and everything else for like the rest of our life, right? Like, you know, and I'm ready to like, have like a whole sprinkle drawer for when it's cookie time <laughs> and like everything else. Like we overdo Christmas and everything else. And like, I think Brooke is gonna be all about it, right? And so maybe this was God's way of my little forever friend, um, which is my prayer for years as a little kid, you know? Um, but um, she's such a blessing to me. Like she's yeah. such a blessing. Yeah. She makes us laugh so much. So much personality, like you know, we always laugh and we're like, imagine if she could talk. She's so spicy already. <laughs> like the only thing next is for her to suck her teeth. <laughs> we were like, she's fed up with us, <laughs> you know, um, with so much joy. And it's, I feel like that's God too. That there can be so much joy and so much pain, you know, but still so much joy, you know. Um, and I'm really, really grateful for that. Definitely. Yeah. And we're grateful for you sharing your story. 
And I told oh, you that you. I had one question that we're going to close mm -hmm. with, which is the traits of a mother who is called blessed. And I'm very interested to see what you thought about, about that question. Sure. So a few things. Um, I would say courage. Um, there have been times, like, honestly, um, I felt like I'm not old enough for this. <laughs> I'm not strong enough for this. Like, can I just go back to being like a kid where someone else figures all of this? You know, um, you know, I just wanted to like, just be like, hold on. Somebody else has to figure this out because I cannot, <laughs> you know, um, but when it's your child, there is nobody else. And you can't just rely on medical professionals, right? At the end of the day, it's a job and they go home to their own kids. So it's up to us to advocate and push for and consistently try to do research to find those answers. So insane level of courage. Um, I would also say acceptance. Um, you know, it was so difficult to get to some space of accepting that this is our life. And, you know, this won't be something that she will just outgrow, right? Um, this won't just be something that will just change all of a sudden. And that there's beauty in the acceptance, you know, there's growth and there's healing in the acceptance. Um, do I have days that I feel like I could just, you know, pull my hair out and run down the street? Yes. You know, um, I have days where I see Brooke frustrated maybe in therapy. And I think to myself, this poor little girl that has to do so many hours of therapy when really and truly she just be running in the yard, but she has to do therapy to try and give her the best shot at life because she has to learn intentionally all the things that all the other kids just take for granted. Kids just naturally walk, naturally crawl, naturally know how to pick up a spoon after you show them one, like just once or twice, like just, they just figure it out. You know, um, that's not Brooke's process. Right. And so I have some insanely grieving days, you know, um, but that comes with accepting. And with that, accepting comes obedience in terms of listening, like really listening, right? Um, and really, really, really trusting the process and just waiting. Um, I would also say patience. Um, sometimes I'm thinking to myself, like, I need the answer now. I need to figure it out now. But God it doesn't work that way. <laughs> we don't just say, hey, I need it today. And he's just like, yeah, let me just tell you what it is. No, you know, it doesn't work that way. Um, so there's so much patience involved, um, you know, um, and perhaps the biggest one of all is daring faith to make all of that possible. There's an insane amount of daring faith to believe that no matter what the world says, no matter what the research articles say, that she may never this, that, and the next, that God is almighty. You know, he can do all things. He can do things that we can't fathom. Mm -hmm. You know, so my limited understanding is exactly that, limited understanding. And that's it, you know? Um, and I truly feel as though Brooke is connected to my purpose and to my part that I was here to play. And like I said, one person in that relay, I have a part to play, she's connected to, to that. So, and that's a, that's, a, that's a divine connection, you know? Um, and so if anything, I feel, I, feel, I feel blessed about it, you know? Um, and I've grown in so many ways, honestly, Zemi, like so many ways, you know? Um, you know? Um, and so I'm really, really grateful. And even her yeah. life, you know, with the studies she's a part of and the work that's going to come out of that and helping people, you know, early on or with their development, if these um, therapies work for her, like there's so much that could come out of even this, you know, even your yes, you're saying, yes, I signed my daughter up for this. Mm -hmm. Yes, God, I'm on board with you for this, for the long haul all of those little steps of yes, we don't know where that's going to end up, you know, for other people. Other people who may not, have, like you said, you don't view yourself as strong, but there's some people who don't even have half of what you have, who need the research, who need your posts, who need your blog posts, who need this live, you know, to, to really help them and encourage them. And so I thank you so much. Um, you are a blessed mother, a blessed woman. And I pray that he continues to strengthen you and that you don't 
feel any fault, you know, that she is in God's hands. Just as you say, you know, your first, your first two are in God's hands every day. She is in God's hands as well. And thank you, Brad. You're doing an amazing <laughs> job. <laughs> You're doing I know, right? For <laughs> my team. Shout out. <laughs> Shout out to you too. You know, we appreciate, we appreciate you so much for all that you do for your family. Yeah. And I just want to close this out in prayer. Sure. So, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, oh God, for this family. I thank you for giving them wisdom and understanding. I thank you that you placed in Inga from a very young age the heart of a researcher, the heart of a scientist, and that she uses that same skill and ability in finding solutions for her family and for her young daughter. I pray that wherever she is hurting, wherever that she needs you, wherever she can't even articulate what she needs from you, God, I pray that you meet her every need, that you continue to mend her heart from the pain of loss, from the pain of what has been revealed, oh God, from the pain of not even knowing what's coming next. I pray that you continue to heal her and also heal Brad and heal this family, dear God. That you continue to increase their laughter and give them things to, to laugh about as a family. A ton of inside jokes, dear God, that people around them would be like, what are they talking about? But this family is so knitted together that they know exactly what a, what a smile means, what a look means, dear God. That you continue to give them internal joy. Joy that surpasses all understanding. Joy that will never go away. May your son, Jesus Christ, personally walk with this family and nurture them. Kiss, tuck them in at night. Even the parents, oh God, just be so nurturing and loving to this family, oh God, as only you can be, as only your son can be. Touch their inner hearts, oh God, and strengthen them for this journey. I thank you and I bless. I bless baby Brooke. I bless Isaiah. What's your daughter's name? Haley. Haley, I bless Haley, and I pray, oh God, that you continue to strengthen them as they continue to walk this out. We love you. We give you all glory, all honor, and all praise, and I thank you for the opportunity to come before you tonight and share this story with others. Amen. 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 So thank you. Have a blessed <laughs> night. As my husband looks on at me. As I go down to <laughs> from start to now. <laughs> and it starts right now, so thank you so much. Bye. 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 <laughs>